Hello everybody, this is Johns Hopkins with Baltimore Heritage and we're back with another of our five minute histories videos. And if it looks like it's still a little bit dark outside and it looks like I just rolled out of bed, that's because both of those are true. Today we're going to talk about the flag house and the flag in this case of course means the Star Spangled Banner. And if you remember the first line of the national anthem about the flag, um, oh say can you see by the dawn's early light. I thought that it would be kind of fun if we had our own dawn's early light when we were doing this video. But we'll get there. Stay tuned. Um, I have to start by saying a thank you to everybody who has given or is thinking about giving. Um, we are a small organization and individual gifts uh, make up the overwhelming majority of our annual budget. So thank you very much. Uh, a sincere thank you. Um, second thank you, brief thank you, is to Amanda Davis, who is the director here at the Flag House, um, for giving me such great information. Thanks, Amanda. All right, let's jump into the Flag House. <clears throat> And if I say, all right, uh, in two seconds or less, who sewed the flag that went on to become so famous and is now hanging in the Smithsonian Institution as one of America's greatest iconic symbols? And if the words Betsy Ross flashed in your brain, even for a second, a brief moment, we are going to march you up to Philadelphia and you can learn all about Betsy Ross and what a great flag maker she was. And then we're going to march you down to Pratt Street here at Pratt and Albemarle and we're going to learn about Mary Pickersgill. She is the woman who sewed our flag and the flag that now hangs in the Smithsonian. So Mary was born in Philadelphia in 1776. Her mother, uh, Hannah Young, was a flag maker. Um, eventually she'll uh, teach that skill to her daughter Mary. Um, but Mary's father dies when she is two and, uh, and eventually the family moves to Baltimore. I believe to be, to be with Mary, some of Mary's older siblings. Um, in Baltimore at age 19, she marries a gentleman, John Pickersgill, um, and back to Philadelphia they go. They move back to Philadelphia for 10 years um, until John dies, uh, and Mary, unlike, um, unfortunately, like her mother, is left a widow. Mary moves back here to Baltimore in 1895, I believe, um, and by 1807, she and her mother and her daughter, Caroline, are renting this house behind me at Pratt and Albemarle. And they're making flags. They're making flags for the US Army, the US Navy. They're making flags for the tons and tons of ships that are coming in and out of Baltimore's Harbor. If you're a ship, you want everybody to know which ship you are, and you can do that with your flag. So um, all is going well uh, for Mary and her flag making business. And then 1813 comes around. We had declared war on Britain again. She was born the year of the American, Rev the, the American Revolution. She's now finds herself in Baltimore, a hotbed of what is the War of 1812. And she is approached by an officer, George Armistead, um, to make a flag so big that anybody could see it even at a distance. I believe those were his words. And so Mary makes a small flag, a, uh, a storm flag, but she also makes one as big as George Armistead wants. Armistead is in charge of the defense of Baltimore and Fort McHenry. We know that the British are coming for us because we're a major city in the United States, the new United States, and we make clipper ships, um, uh, the dreaded clipper ships that so outmaneuvered the British fleet. So she makes this flag, and it is a whopping flag. Um, it weighs 50 pounds. It's, uh, it takes nine men to hoist it onto a flagpole. Um, each stripe is two feet wide, and each star is two feet tip to tip. So a really big flag. Um, the next year, 1814, Armistead, unfortunately, um, has an opportunity to fl fly it. The British had burned Washington, and, and we did a whole segment on uh, Fort McHenry. So suffice it to say uh, that George Armistead flies the flag at Fort McHenry. Um, the British bomb us all night long in a long, rainy night. Um, but indeed, at dawn, the flag is still there for the British to see, um, as well as Francis Scott Key. Frank, as they called him then, as his friends called him, and Frank was so inspired with the scene of Mary's flag still flying over Fort McHenry um, that he pens the, what becomes the national anthem to the tune of an uh, English drinking song, Anacreon in Heaven, that was popular both in, uh, in Britain and in the United States at times. At times. So, uh, so we obviously uh, uh, defeat the British at the Battle of Baltimore in Fort McHenry. Um, and so what happens to the flag and what happens to Mary and what happens to the house? So let's start with the flag. After the war, 
um, George Armistead ends up with a flag. We don't know exactly how, but my suspicion is that, uh, that uh, he was pretty proud of the flag when it was made, and he was probably pretty proud of it flying over Fort McHenry at the end of this incredible bombardment. So I, I suspect he took it home with him. He kind of deserved it. So he has it. When he dies, he bequeaths it to his wife, um, who keeps it. He dies, I think, in 1818, so not long after the battle. His wife lives until the 1860s, um, and she bequeaths it to her daughter, um, a woman uh, named Mary Ann Appleton. Um, and her daughter realizes the value of the flag and starts showing it uh, privately to friends for its importance. She then bequeaths it to her son, whose name I think is Ethan Appleton, um, who eventually loans it to the Smithsonian Museum. And then uh, in, uh, I believe, 1910, 1912, somewhere in there, um, uh, gives it permanently to the Smithsonian. And in 2006, the Smithsonian uh, completed a multi-million dollar fantastic restoration of the flag. And it's hanging prominently, maybe one of the most visited sites of the Smithsonian um, uh, Museum of American History. All right, so that's the flag. What happens to Mary? Mary, uh, bit, partly because of the flag and partly because she's a good flag maker, goes on to have a very successful business. In 1820, she has enough money to buy this house that she's been renting for so many years. Um, and she, began, she uh, eventually becomes a social reformer for mostly for women's causes. Um, she goes on to lead an organization, uh, a, a social reform organization, for nearly 40 years. And one of the things they do, and she's responsible for, is building a, a home for aged women. That was the term in West Baltimore. Soon joined by a home for aged men. Um, and eventually, uh, after Mary's death, uh, that those two homes combine and move to Towson. And today we know it as the Pickersgill Retirement Community, Mary Pickersgill in reference to her. And she's buried, I believe, at Loudoun Cemetery. All right, so what happens finally to the house? Um, the house here is, at, it was built before Mary's uh, arrival. Um, it was built around 1792, uh, part of a, a speculative real estate venture. A gentleman, uh, Phil Pott, um, is trying to develop along the Jones Falls on some property he and his family have. Turns out to be a good investment. Um, they build what's now called Old Town or Jonestown. Um, but it's built in 1792. We know that Mary buys it in 1820. Um, and then she, when she passes away in the 1850s, she, uh, she leaves it to her daughter. And her daughter and daughter's husband live here for a while. Eventually, they sell the building. It goes through a number of different owners and uses. It's a liquor store for a while. Um, for a while, a, a female orphan asylum acquires it, um, not to keep children in, but to use uh, to generate revenues, and it's used for various commercial businesses. Um, and by 18, I'm sorry, by 1914, um, the house features prominently in Baltimore's uh, centennial celebration, 100-year celebration of the War of 1814. People recognizing the importance of this building and Mary, uh, Mary Pickersgill um, in that uh, uh, effort. And in 1927, Baltimore city buys it and turns it into the flag house and today it is the flag house um, it has been uh, it has been operating as a museum for almost 100 years here on uh, Pratt and Albemarle Street and I'll leave with one uh, one other quiz if you failed the Mary Pickersgill uh, Betsy Ross quiz in the beginning maybe you can redeem yourself um, lot 302 where this started was on a street called Queen Street um, it was Queen Street for a long time until we changed the name uh, to Pratt Street. Why do we change the name and who is Pratt? If you think Enoch Pratt, you're not quite right. Um, uh, it is not the library fame gentleman. It is a gentleman named uh, Charles Pratt, um, an English member of parliament, one of the very few who opposed the dreaded um, uh, tax acts, the Stamp Act, that led up to the Revolutionary War. Um, and we were so, uh, so grateful to him for that opposition that we named our street, we changed it from Queen Street to Pratt Street. Incidentally, he became, he went on into the peerage, he became a nobleman and took on the title Lord Camden. So if you want to know where Camden Yards gets its name, um, it's that same gentleman. All right, thanks so much, and I'll encourage you, come on down here to the Flag House. Um, check it out. It is a wonderful historic building um, and been a part of Baltimore for over 200 years. Thanks again, and we'll see you soon.